Thank you everyone for joining Techie Personal Financial Bootcamp. Uh, I'm excited, I actually have my first guest ever today and his name is Nick Armstrong. He is the geek in chief at WTF Marketing. And yep, what does that w- exactly what you think it does? <laughs> yeah, I was just about to ask you that, which I already know the answer. But um, as you can tell, just from his description, um, as far as his title, as well as his business name, he's a little bit different and, and it works really well for him. I actually first met him at a business networking event. I was, uh, my business was only open for two months at that time frame. And he seemed like a, a rock star because he showed up late to the, the party and he was like the person everyone wanted to go and talk to you. And he was so gracious and nice. He talked to everyone. And then he especially um, took the time to share his story with me and then asked me a lot about my story. So made Nick stand out in my mind. We've been in contact ever since. Uh, I'm going to talk about a couple of his background highlights. And I didn't get this from him. I did some uh, internet sleuthing and found some information. So you can guess as to whether I found this on his business website or on a, a dating app bio website. Um, but this is from uh, Nick's bio. Hello there. Looking for someone who understands your business inside and out? I can ROI your C2A and massage your SEO on your CMS like a champ, all while cooking you a lovely dinner. I dig the self-starter types, the kind who deep down have an understanding that when you own your own business, Casual Friday really means pants-free Friday, or pants-free every day, actually. The kind that can have a sense of humor when something goes viral once in a while. Shy, quite tight, you'll never be bored. I'm involved in all sorts of projects around Fort Collins, including TEDx Foco, Ignite Fort Collins, and the Digital Gunslingers. A little bit about me, for 15 years, I built websites and marketed for businesses. When I started, it was a group that wrote Star Trek fan fiction. Let's face it, I'm a catch. So for my listeners listening, uh, is that from a data website or his business website? And the answer is it's both, right? It's kind of like a mixture combination, what you did there, Nick? Yeah, so that was actually from a blog post that I wrote about how marketing is a lot like dating. Um, And, you know, people don't really equate marketing to a lot of fun things <laughs> they're like oh i have to be on a platform a facebook or a twitter or an instagram or i have to figure out how to create content meanwhile uh their customers because they're like trying to in- interact with you and engage with you on a more human level they're only getting whatever like bleary-eyed bored content that you're putting out and not really the engagement factor behind all that so yeah, well, I, how- I encouraged I encouraged folks to write up their their business bios as a dating profile app to sort of spice it up a bit. Awesome. How often do companies that do marketing have someone that's like totally offsite and has no clue like what the business is or their stories? Like, how often is it like that segmented where they're just doing the marketing stuff that they would do for any company, regardless of who it was? You know. I think that's more common when you are hiring out inexperienced uh, marketing, um, marketing consultants. And, and the, the idea there would just be, well, I've got a project that I want to pay 20 to $25 an hour for. Um, I have um, a really limited scope, a really limited budget, and I'm going to hire this person for that. And then that person um, makes some suggestions that sound really good. And they get hired on to do more and more and more. And then they realize they can make a business out of it. And then they start doing that more and more and more for other people for, you know, 35, 40, 50 dollars an hour or whatever. Um, And they don't really change their tactics. And especially if they're remote. Um, Now, I'm not saying that a remote marketing consultant can't do a good job um, because that's what I do. And I I like to think that I do a good job. Um, (laughs) But the, the idea of individualizing your services for each client is maybe not apparent to a, an entry-level marketing consultant. Um, and it takes time to gather that knowledge. And I'm, I'm being gracious here because um, it's, <laughs> there are so many, it's so, it's so hard to get your, to, to earn your chops essentially in marketing sure. in pretty much any field, but it's in marketing, it's, you know, easy to say that you have the chops without really earning them. Um, because you can get really good at a platform, you can get really good at whatever. Um, the thing that I became really good at is really understanding the needs and the problems of business owners. Um, 
And that gave me the edge to get that research early on. So when I came on board to a new client, I would have this questionnaire and I would have, you know, I'd meet with their team. Even if it was remotely, I'd do a Skype or something like that. I would talk with the key stakeholders. I would go out and actually purchase their products and figure out how to use their services and really put myself in the, the shoes of the consumer. So when, when it came time to market them, I knew most of the phases of the business. I might not have known some of the more in-depth technical things that I would have known if I was sitting in the office having done it for 10 years. Sure. Um, as most CEO, CEOs and um, CEOs slash janitors know, <laughs> the, the, the small business owner um, or the solopreneurs know, you wear all the hats. And when you have to hand off that marketing task to somebody else, you're just like crossing your fingers that they do it just as well as you would. Yeah. Um, but in truth, uh, as long as you have a marketing consultant that's really well focused on the, the thing that you do, the value that it brings, and how your customers are interpreting that value with their worldview, um, you're going to be better off than you know, whatever meager time that the CEO slash janitor can put into it. Yeah, that's awesome. And so I'm going to go a little bit more into why I thought you'd be a good fit for uh, this podcast because uh, you have a really interesting background. And so um, obviously you're talking a little bit about where you are today, but there is a whole kind of life that occurred, right? Um, uh, that got you to this point where you have the confidence, you're, you're wearing a, a suit jacket right now in this interview and <laughs> rocking it. And so like, were you always this confident? And I guess, let me frame it this way. So I invite you here because I know your journey is really unique. Um, and you actually started out knee deep in kind of the technology world, but then you ended up developing and kind of changing, uh, your trajectory pretty dramatically. And now you have your fingers in so many cool things. Like you still have, uh, your finger on the pulse of some kind of technology aspects, I'm sure of your job, but that's not kind of all you do anymore. So tell me a little bit about that journey. Sure. So I was, I was a CSU Ram. Um, I graduated with a, a dual degree in marketing and CIS, um, and I added the marketing component on. I was going to graduate in like three-ish years with the CIS, Yep. Um, and it just wasn't enough. Like, I didn't feel like I had enough value for myself, um, and I, in my sophomore year, I joined up at KCSU, which is the on-campus radio station. Um, I became the production director, which is the guy that makes all of the audio files and the bumps and things like that for the DJs. So when you hear a special sound effect or an intro that has some music behind it or whatever else, something funny that they've done, yep. that's, that's what we do. Cool. That's what a production director does. And so um, I actually came up with my very first marketing campaign <laughs> at KCSU um, called the Squirrel Liberation Army. And it was because the squirrels at CSU are notorious for like coming up, attacking you for food. Like yep, I remember. On your backpack or on you, it's your toast. So we hid bags of popcorn um, with tickets, like concert tickets or other prizes attached to them throughout campus and then announced like this secret location with high-pitched squeaky squirrel voices. It was hilarious. <laughs> And then, of course, the actual squirrels were out at those locations, like tearing open the bags of popcorn. So you had to be like super brave to get at the tickets. Yeah. Well, yeah, and hope the tickets intact and everything too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we uh, just in case we would always put like a come see, come claim at KCSU. So it was, oh, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> um, but I, I I really sort of took on the value of this marketing side of things and added a media studies minor to my my degree. Um, and, and started adding on to the CIS. And I found that when I graduated, it was 2007. And uh, okay. this was just before the Great Recession, right? Yep. So jobs are starting to tail off. People are starting to get freaked out. Um, and I, I was able to land my first job at HP here in Fort Collins. Yep. Um, and it, I was earning a ridiculous sum of money for somebody who's just graduated. Um, and it was, I, I found out later, two years later, uh, that I'd misspelled the word university on my resume. You know, the degree granting institution that was supposed to teach me how to spell check <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or make sure that I was thorough enough to do that. Um, and so I was a really horrible programmer and I was a horrible programmer for like mm, two years. So I went through a span of like 12 jobs. I was only fired three times. I just kept jumping from job to job to job to job. 
And this is during, you know, the lead into the Great Recession. And my friends are like, how are you doing this? You do, you, where are these jobs coming from? <laughs> um, and I actually wrote my blog. That was my first blog was called Psychotic Resumes um, and turned it into a, an ebook for my friends so they could, you know, replicate my success. You're doing something with that right now too, right? Yeah, I am. I'm actually, <laughs> because the first one was written really heavily on like Gen Y and how to deal with like the establishment of like the old white haired dude that wasn't really moving out of the way for newbies to come in and do the thing. Yeah. Well, I, I think that's still a lot of the same feelings. Um, <laughs> ultimately, like that's why I felt like I had to start my own companies because there's just too many people are holding on to like the old way of doing things. And even, even if it's the wrong, wrong way to do stuff. It's pretty well entrenched. And, and honestly, um, it's an, it's an economic pressure that's causing mm -hmm. that to happen. And not just because they're like stubborn and old and stodgy or whatever. Like the real, the real crux of the problem is, um, they, they can't, they can't move on. They can't retire. They can't, you know, bail out. And so, um, it's, it's a matter of there's upward pressure and downward pressure and everybody's just getting cranky. So <laughs> there's, no, there's not really, so the, the new version of the book addresses that and how to deal with, those intergenerational conflicts that occur and the, the first one dealt with it a little bit, um, maybe a little bit more harshly than it would have <laughs> since I was 10 years younger when I wrote it. Yeah, you were, you were raw I, and you and you have gray like hair when it was fresh. <laughs> so. yeah, I have gray hair now, so I get it. Um, <laughs> the, the idea is um, that I was continuously working on projects. Uh, and so as I was, you know, looking for jobs and doing other things. I was always doing a side hustle. And uh, eventually it got to a point where um, I, the stress of being a horrible programmer caught up to me. Um, and that's, it wasn't really like imposter syndrome. It was like imposter dumb. <laughs> it was, like you I just was were not good or do you feel like you just were moving on too quick? Like, was it like a mixture of imposter syndrome and then just jump in before you kind of caught it? Cause like, I think a lot of people, sometimes even like overeducated people. That's why if people get overeducated and get like a lot of degrees and things like that is because they have that imposter syndrome. Do you feel like maybe if you would have stuck it out like an extra month or two that maybe you would have caught on and felt like maybe you weren't that bad? I, when I, when I jumped into programming, my dad was a programmer. Okay. Um, and my, my, a lot of my family was programmers and, uh, I love the idea. I love the concept of even now I'm like, Oh, I love JavaScript because I can program JavaScript pretty well. And I, you know, it's, that's just like the play language. It's a toy language. Um, and a lot of JavaScript programmers are like, what? You just, you know, <laughs> yeah, um, get a bunch but, of <laughs> and I, I like the idea of like Python and I like the idea of learning all these things. Um, and I was pretty good at getting the structure of a thing down. Um, what I was horrible at, and I had to, I had to really like, I had to dialogue with some of my, my, my family, my friends, um, my coworkers. I was like, what, why, am, why do I suck at this? Like, I don't, I'm not able to level up in it. Right. And, uh, it was really frustrating for me because I would get to, I'd hit a wall and usually the wall would be, I have this really good idea. I really am excited to implement it. And I would like to do this. And then the management would say, Nope. <laughs> or, that's great, but first learn this like super stupidly complex library that has no documentation, and if you don't learn it, then you're out. So um, I actually was written up at one of my jobs, and this was my second to last job before I, I started WTF. Uh, I was written up for being overly direct. And the reason is, we were having this latency issue with the databases, and I looked around at the, the teams, and I said, you know, you guys manage the databases, you guys manage the tech web, you know, infrastructure, you guys manage the website infrastructure. What, you know, we, we're having this problem, what's happening here? And it turns out the database team a couple of years ago had actually come up with a solution to solve the whole thing, but it had never been implemented. So I said, oh, that's great. So I took it and I, I presented it to the other teams. I said, is this okay? Is this a, you know, good thing? Everybody was thumbs up, green light, go. I took it to the CEO because my boss was out and there was only, you know, me, my boss, and then the CEO. I took it to the CEO because my boss was out and I said, the database team has this great solution. Um, it was done three years ago. We think it could be done now. And my boss came back into town, was pissed. 
And he what did not. Yeah. So I got written up for being overly direct because I went, I jumped the, I hopped over a level and went direct to the CEO with the idea. <laughs> oh, okay. Which okay. was policy. <laughs> yeah, no, no. So it's I, like, I see, but so did they, like you got written up, they implemented it and then you just kind of took off like, yeah, yeah. I, I put in as soon as it stuck because I, I contested it with HR and of course they were like, well, our hands are tied and, and the CEO was like, you, you know, you're really a troublemaker. And I, I was like, okay, I, I put in my resignation notice and said, I'm out two weeks later. And uh, the man, the, you would think you would think that obviously that, that probably wasn't the right process to go through but you did it with like the best intentions and you were doing it to improve, like dramatically improve the situation. And you were excited, I imagine. Yeah. I mean, there's, and you got in trouble. I had to find out. So my, my great grandmother told me that, um, you know, she says, if you're anything like me and some of the other people in our family, you're serial entrepreneurial. Like there's no other path for you. You are going to have a hard time following anybody else's drum. <laughs> like there's just no way that you can follow those marching orders. Um, and so it and, turns and out she was right. Start telling you that. Like what age were you? Uh, I had just, I was on my like third or fourth job. It was, I had okay. left HP. I was really, I went and visited and was just like having, having some issues and was like, okay, what do I, you know, what do I do next? I was having that like, quarter life crisis that, that most millennials have yeah, um, yeah and was like i don't know what i want to do next i'm just so tired of finding yet another job um and would continue to do that for another 10 or so but yeah i mean it was it was a frustrating time um and that stress caught up with me so i was on that second to last job i put in my two-week notice and on my second to last day um i, I felt kind of sick i went home and uh, I was like laying out on the couch, still not feeling better. A couple hours went by, still not feeling any better, feeling worse. And luckily I had a friend at the time who was a lot smarter than I was and said, <laughs> you should probably go to the doctor. So um, drove me to the doctor and uh, the doctor pushed on a, a spot on my stomach and said, tell me if this hurts. And I screamed like a dying giraffe. Whoa, what do, so and, what does that sound like? Like <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a horrible sound. So you just don't we don't we don't repeat it. We don't want to haunt people's dreams. Uh, we um, don't want to break people's phones or whatever they're listening to yeah, us on. Exactly. <laughs> and so she's she said, Well, you can either drive really quickly to the hospital or I can call you an ambulance because she knew I was broke, right? Because I was I was just about to leave a job. <laughs> um, like <laughs> I don't want you to be broke yet. Then. Like it's not like you were behind, it just I was moving into a new job and she, she, I guess I had said something about it, but she was like, Oh yeah, we don't, you know, I looked like the, the broke college type. So <laughs> she was like, I can call you an ambulance or you can drive really quickly to the hospital. Went to the hospital, turned out my appendix was about to burst. Um, the doctor comes rushing in and he's, you know, I've never seen a, a doctor as worried as I have seen this doctor. He's just like stressed out and we're like, he's like, right, we're going to, we got to do the thing. We got to cut you open. We got to do this. And, and you know, um, we're, we're thinking it's going to be like this and, and, uh, you'll wake up, you'll be just fine. And so was it um, stress that caused that? Yeah, that actually. So, <laughs> so afterwards the doc comes in and he's like, so that was really close. Um, <laughs> oh, that was, that was really close. Like you were just about to have, and if, apparently if your appendix bursts, there's like the, the, the odds of a lot of really bad things happening to you go way up. Um, and so he's like, that was really close. Your appendix was wrapped all the way around and all this stuff. And like, this was, this was bad. And, uh, you know, the only reason about the only reason that somebody your age has this extreme of an issue is because they're, they're stressed out. Stress is the number one contributor to this particular type of, of issue. And I said, well, okay. <laughs> so I'm like morphined up and everything. And he's like, well, you know, what are you doing with your life? I said, I don't know. <laughs> I just, yeah, the, you're starting to stress you out more right there. Yes. You're trying to heal up. Yeah. And so <laughs> he said, well, you should think about that because now, you know, you've got, this other, you've got this other chance now. You've got another chance. So what do you want to do? And uh, he left me with that thought. And um, I asked ahead of time, I was joking with the nurse. I said, can I have my appendix when you're done with it? I just really don't, can I have this thing? Yeah. They told me no, because it's like a medical waste thing. But anyway, wouldn't that have been cool? Like just have it like on my <laughs> yeah. desk preserved. Like this is the story of how I changed my life. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and 
just the fact you're alive, I guess, is is huge. It's uh, but it was that, it was that doctor. I'm sure charged a huge bill and whatever this going rate is to, to do that emergency operation. But based I, so on I, what I know, you're pretty happy with where things are. So it, like it's cool that he's easily paid for himself in more yes. ways than one. <laughs> he's, he's earned it. Um, <laughs> I. Yeah, that's a funny thing because I went to my next job like a week late um, because, and I knew that I was, had been under surgery and uh, they said, well, you know, when are you going to start wearing pants again? Because I had a, instead of the laparoscopic, they use the little wand things, you know, um, and they make little one inch holes instead. Okay. They had to do a shark bite, which is like a six inch incision to get this uh, because they were, that's how little time they had. They couldn't do it with the, with the things. So, um, I, I was, uh, I was at that job and they were like, oh, well, when are you going to wear pants again? And, uh, that's about when I knew I was going to get fired. <laughs> so wait, wait, start, what, what were you wearing though? <laughs> sweatpants. I was wearing, okay. cause you can't, I can't wear a belt, yeah. right? You can't wear a belt. And <laughs> like the doc told me it was doctor's orders. You cannot wear anything with a buckle or a, a you know, tight, anything that's tight. Cause you will tear open your incision. Yeah. Um, and so, so I couldn't do that until the staples were out. And by then they were ready to fire me. So, um, I, I was fired from that job. Um, looked around and said, well, I've got $10,000 in medical debt. Um, I've got, you know, no real assets or anything else like that besides my skills, but I better, I better think about a plan. So I pulled my 401k, which I know we're not supposed to do, but I pulled my 401k. Um, I paid off all my medical debt. I paid for a month of rent and a month of groceries. And that was it. That was my runway. And that's all I had. So I decided that I was, I had to do something that I was kind of familiar with. So I started building out websites. Um, and I was, I would build out websites because I had been building out websites for about 10 years at that point. Um, okay. I was just as a hobby, you know, yeah, like I want to make a kind of website. Side, side hustles that you mentioned. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Just like a, you know, here and there a hundred dollars for a friend or, you know, 150, whatever. And so I started charging 350 for a WordPress website, a customized WordPress website. And that's that nothing. Good deal. Yes. It is ridiculous. <laughs> it's like one tenth of the average going rate for the low end of a custom and not even a custom. It's just like, I'll set it up for you. I'll create 10 pages of content, blah, blah, blah. And so, and so I was like, okay, um, if this doesn't get me into, you know, get some business, I don't know what will. And, uh, ended up talking with, um, I saw an ad for, uh, Ignite Fort Collins and, uh, it's a f speedy presentation style, five minutes talks. Um, and they're like 20 slides, 15 seconds per slide. Nice. And so I, I put in a presentation pitch, uh, and it was literally like me, 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 self-promotional me, this, and the organizer called me and said, you can't do that, but I would love to hear more about this idea of like how the, you know, how social media is like the, the wild west and how, you know, you're dealing with that in marketing. So cool. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> awesome. They even took the time to give you that feedback. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, that's Ron Zazdinsky. I mean, and he became one of my mentors and, um, he actually gave me, he fronted me later, he fronted me the money to start my own meetup group called the Digital Gunslingers, where we taught social media for like an hour of like Twitter or an hour of Facebook for a dollar, and then later five dollars, and we took that money and donated it to the food bank, because I figured I might need it later. <laughs> 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 so if I was as nice to them as possible ahead of time, they might uh, take some, some mercy on me. Um, so I... I uh, I did that for a long time and that group um, spurred other people to start their own marketing companies and their own social media marketing companies um, and their own content marketing companies and people started their own ventures, which was really cool. And That's it was sweet. just as a result of the things that, and, and I was teaching them and things that they were learning because the meetup community at that time was really good. Um, I partnered up with some folks, um, Angel, uh, Angel Kiewikowski at Cohere. Yeah. Um, and we started doing things like pod camp at Cohere. Um, we did freelance camp together. Um, I eventually took on a TEDx license. 
Um, and we were the very first TEDx in Northern Colorado. Um, I sat on the board for TEDx CSU for a very short time and advised the board of TEDx Front Range for a little bit. I was invited as a speaker for TEDx Front Range um, wow. because all of my work through, and at, at the time I was also working with Ignite and doing all sorts of crazy stuff there and um, I eventually took over ownership of that in tangent with um, Jana um, from Launch NoCo. Jana Sanser. Yeah. Yep. And so we did, yeah, I mean, there was, there was so many cool things and I was speaking at Ignite and, you know, getting my, my chops up. I did an actual Colorado tour of all of the Ignites and spoke at all of them. Um, oh. I spoke at the Cheyenne one as well and, and just got my name out there. So uh, one thing that's huge, I think, in addition to like just financial management, but time management, like how, how do you make all this happen? Um, well, I wasn't. I didn't. I, I got married about a year after I started my business. Okay. Um, and my wife and I um, were. We. I mean, we're we're kind of introverts. We don't. You know, we're we don't have a ton of extra hobbies out and about. We don't have sports teams or anything else like that. Yep. Um, and so uh, we we have a lot of time to devote to our hobbies. And so we would do. You know, she was big into card making. She was becoming a teacher at the time and and going through her master's program, um, and super driven. And she understood and appreciated that about me as well. And so um, I was able to focus a lot of my business early on and, and take time to go out and do these things. And she was super understanding about that and supportive. Um, and I landed Budweiser as a client because I stood in for one of my friends at a speaker symposium. And all of the chairs were aligned in presenter style facing the front lectern. And I was like, this is, I don't want to do this. This is, no, this is horrible. <laughs> I had the entire staff realign the chairs. I'm sure they thought I was a pain in the ass, but it was, it was great. I realigned the entire, uh, entire room as a giant circle. And I spent the entire hour of my talk, like running in between and out, out of this outer ring and inner ring of these chairs um, and talking one-on-one -on -one with people about their businesses. And people stayed. Some people fled in terror because it was yeah. not like, I'm not sitting in my chair. I don't have any you know, invisibility in this room. But the people <laughs> who stayed, Budweiser, um, uh, Fort Collins Brewery, at, at, which still existed at the time before it became Red Truck. Um, all of these great businesses that would then later go on to hire me um, and really bolster my, my resume. And so yeah, and, and that's kind of part of that directness that you had early on that wasn't appreciated. Now, now these companies, yeah, sure, some fled, but they probably weren't going to be a good <laughs> fit for, for working with you anyways. Now, the other ones saw like, man, this guy... It's a little crazy, but like, I want to hear more. I want to see like where this goes next. And then, and then ultimately yeah. up becoming clients. That's awesome. And the, the imposter where, where I had felt like an imposter as a developer, the imposter syndrome, it was very distinct, the feeling. Um, okay. And I think there was, I, it's a, there was a unique moment of clarity where I was able to say like, man, I really do suck as a developer and able to honestly own that and say like, that's what being like an imposter looks like, like trying your best, but still failing and not able to get it done. Um, and not able to even know if you're like dedicating time to learning and dedicating time to getting better and dedicating time to studying and doing your best to like level up and still not able to do it. Yeah. Um, being okay with saying, I love that in theory, but it's not for me. Um, and then translating that into marketing, um, when I switched my skill set over, um, having, you know, my tech background, you know, in theory, but also having it through WordPress, which I was able to do really well and PHP, yeah. which I was able to do really well and JavaScript, which I was able to do really well, taking those pieces that I could do really well and could level up, um, and then teaching that out. Um, and then also knowing that, you know, when I felt like, I was really not, you know, I was sucking at something or not able to do something well. I still could feel that feeling of leveling up where I couldn't over here. Yep. That distinction has pretty much eliminated that feeling of imposter syndrome for the most part. Um, I still have it from time to time where, you know, you struggle with like, oh, well, I haven't done this before. Do I really know what I'm doing? It's usually about five minutes before an event doors open. <laughs> yeah, um, like, oh, man. <laughs> like, oh yeah, we have to do this again. And oh man, it's, you know, but um, I find that that's been really freeing is that 
uh, I've discovered something that I suck at. I know that I suck at it. I, I am horrible at it. I don't want to do it again. And I couldn't level it up. Even if I tried really hard, the, the curve was too intense for it or my passion wasn't there for it enough or, you know, whatever it was. Do with like enjoyability, like I enjoyed like, programming, enjoying it. So no, like, I, I, I did what I didn't enjoy was working with, I didn't enjoy working with other people. Um, <laughs> enough. I think that's really, yeah. you know, it's a group project thing. We're like, yeah. okay, we, we're a team. We're all working towards this thing. And I have to use this shared library, which there's no documentation on, and I don't understand it. Um, and I don't understand the inputs because when I try to throw the inputs in, it would give me some random stuff out, which is anyway, there's, there's, there was too much complexity, um, with the team dynamics as well, or I can interface with a business owner sit down, have an honest conversation with them over an hour and understand all the intricacies of how their business works and what they need to do to, to market it, what their core problems are and how to solve them. Whereas I couldn't do that with the programming. So I don't know if that's like a, I was able to articulate the problems, but I wasn't able to articulate it in code. And so there's not really a, there wasn't a way to, for me to level that up, but for marketing and for business analysis and strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Because I, I got that world more. Um, and I think that it's, it's just, you know, um, some, some people are well suited to understanding how Excel spreadsheet works, you know, <laughs> and, and other people are not. Um, and I, I make that joke all the time. Like I, I, I don't ever touch my money. I just, I look at the check, I say, that's nice. And then I hand it off to somebody else to handle. Yeah. I don't want to look at it. I don't want to know about it. I just want to know that the, the, there's positive figures somewhere in a bank somewhere that are, you know, in my favor and I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Yeah, so you're making progress um, is is probably part of that key. But then, yeah, you're you're busy. You don't necessarily enjoy it or or have the time with with all the cool stuff you're going uh, on and doing. And uh, one just quick mention is one of the things that because um, you do so many things, right? You just rattle all, off a bunch of things, and you still haven't hit on a lot of stuff. Like you do that Kessel Run five k mm -hmm. is a five k. Yeah, so. <laughs> The, the the what ended up happening Budweiser and Fort Collins Brewery um, led into other local clients like the Poudre River Public Library District. Um, yep. And any time that I was acting as a as a you know as a consultant for some business, I would try to play their strengths. And one of the things that the library district wanted to do is increase you know uh, the awareness and the the prevalence of programming for youth literacy. Um, and that was a major, it's a major programming goal for them. It's a major, you know, goal for all of the things that they do across the library. Um, and we were looking at how we could raise money for specific programming for that end. And um, uh, the idea of creating our own Comic Con had been sort of floating around in my head for a while because there was Denver, um, there was Starfest, um, there was all these other different like indie cons that were sitting out there, but there wasn't anything in Northern Colorado. Yeah. And so I said, well, why, why can't we do this? We started looking into the logistics of doing it. Um, we had no idea what it would take. We rented out the Azalon Center for a day. Um, we, we got everybody loaded in. Um, we had, I think, 100 vendors that first year. Um, we had no clue what we were doing. We just advertised it wherever we could um, and talked with people and, and, and tried to get as many people there as possible. And we were like, well, you know, it'll be a great party for us if this yeah, doesn't go yeah. anywhere. <laughs> um, and it turned out that it, it, we had about 1500 people there that first year. Wow. Um, how many were you expecting? Like you were expecting, we were like expecting about a thousand. Um, okay. and, and I honestly, we were maybe expecting about 500. <laughs> like we didn't know how many people were going to show up to this thing, yeah. but it was what, it, what ended up happening was, there's a huge undertapped market in Fort Collins for um, pop culture fandom. And yep. they were completely, and I say untapped, but they're re really just underserved. They didn't have a platform be besides um, Dave Graham's um, The Geeks Come Out at Night. Um, and that ran for several years, was very successful, um, and didn't, you know, didn't really accrue critical mass because he it was a party that he hosted at his HOA's clubhouse. I mean, that's, okay. you know. Yeah, invite cool. only. Yeah, I mean, there was so there was a group, there was a crowd, there was an audience that was just not being, you know, activated, and didn't have as in as most things in Fort Collins was siloed off by itself. Um, 
and not really being served. So I was able to tap into that um, alongside Paula watson Lightcamp from the library district and Nate Scott, who is running the Fort Collins Zombie Crawl at the time. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. And we, as a team, um, recruited people who were a lot smarter than us to continue that thing on. And uh, it's grown every year. Our team has grown by leaps and bounds. And now we're recruiting from volunteers that, volu you know, they're, they're now our staff who are our volunteers in year two. <laughs> That's pretty sweet, man. And yeah. yeah, like one thing that definitely stood out, and I mentioned it in the intro, what, how I first met you, you, you know so many people, like you build relationships. I think that's either on your website or on your LinkedIn, like you enjoy b building community and relationships and it shows here, like I don't know how many names you've dropped in this podcast, like without even having to think I'm horrible with names, like especially like if you, if I had to just I, start pulling them out really quickly, I'd be stumbling all over. So that's awesome. That's, like the, what's interesting is, so we've over the last five years, this will be our fifth year of Comic-Con over the last five years, we've raised 95,000 for the library district. But, oh, man. and I can't take credit for that, right? What, what I can say is I recruited some really smart people who helped yep. us accomplish this thing. And so I, you know, I, I, my wife said the other day that I get things done. Like I just come in and I see an issue and it's, I put my focus on and it's done. Right. So that could be like art in public places, or it could be some aspect of, you know, our neighborhood that needs improved or whatever else. But yeah. I, when I do that, um, I only ever create a shell. Like I have this, I want to go here. What do you guys think? And then I recruit people who are a lot smarter than me to take on yeah, to various it. aspects of it. And they make it so much better than the original, like whatever thing I had in mind, they make it so much better. And it's, it's consistently been true throughout everything that I do that the people that I recruit um, are generous with their time. They're generous with their expertise. They're uh, generous with their sharing and their ability to do what they uh, say they're going to do. Yep. They're, they are purposeful about their responsibilities and intentional about what they take on. Um, and so it's, it creates this really cool dynamic of very focused, very intentional people who are all aligned towards a common goal. Um, and, you know, I might have been the, the instigator or the person that put you know, some sort of plan into place. Like the, the master the, planner, like yeah, a strategist. Like, and I, you know, it's, <laughs> I, I, I tend to be a little bit like, I don't, I don't take on a lot of credit for things. Um, <laughs> but what I do is I, I, I love to shower the people that I'm around with praise. Um, yeah, and because awesome. they, you know, with, without their contributions, without their guidance and support and help, um, the thing just wouldn't be, worth talking about if i had tried to do it myself it just wouldn't be worth talking about so the best well, things that i've be ever done by yourself either right like sorry what was that it, it wouldn't be as fun if you were no. doing oh my yourself. god no i've got you know you know how many how many voices can you do <laughs> how many hats can you wear yeah. uh, especially when you have different projects at, at different levels um if you are the ceo slash janitor for Comic-Con, TEDx, you know, WTF, all of these other things that I want to be doing. Um, there's just no, it's not fun to, to not play with other people. You know, you got to play well with other people. Yeah. So I, I know that goes against some of the things I said <laughs> earlier about the like group project thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think if you're intentional about who you, um, who you can work with well, um, and you're honest about that, like I was, I founded a, uh, a restaurant marketing group with another great entrepreneur in town. Um, we were very a type and immediately were butting heads about yeah. everything under the sun. Um, I still love this other entrepreneur and it's, and you know, their business is fantastic and they're doing really well. Um, but we both sat down and said, this sucks. Um, <laughs> why are, you know, we, we're friends. Why are we having so many problems with this? And it was just our management styles were conflicting. So yeah. um, it's sort of like that, that scene in uh, Spider-Man, <laughs> Into the Spider-Verse, where, you know, all the Spider-Men get together and they look at each other and they're like, you're like me. <laughs> yeah, and, just a little And they different. just are like, oh. <laughs> But instead of a glorious uh, evil doing, you know, uh, evil doing 
fighting, you know, band, uh, let me, let me, let me restart that sentence. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Instead of a, a glorious, um, evil battling force of daring do, we ended up with just calamity. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm like, even like in the movies, like the Avengers or whatever, like those people, a lot of similar personality traits and, and it's not easy always. Um, they didn't have a choice. Like they had to in order to save the world, but when there's other things you can do and there's other projects you can do and enjoy, like they, you guys didn't necessarily need each other for that project. Um, so yeah. that's, that's well, true. occurred because before. Tony Stark was bored. That's <laughs> <Yeah>. really. <laughs> um, so since this is a personal finance podcast as well, I wanted to give you a little bit of flexibility and choice to choose to answer one of the following two questions. So either okay. the best financial advice you've ever received or the worst financial decision you've ever made and, and why? <sighs> um, I think the worst, the worst financial decision I have ever made was not seeking out better advice when I was in college about how to, cause I had, I had graduated um, with, my parents rewarded grades, right? And so um, I would get an A. Instead of working a job, they agreed because, you know, when dad was a programmer, we had the means to be able to do it. Yeah. Um, instead of working a job, um, my dad wanted me to focus on school mm -hmm. and said, this is your job. You need to focus really well in doing this. And so um, when you pull an A, this is what we'll, we'll pay out for you. And that ended up in a savings account, um, which then, you know, in college became spending money. And that okay. was just a horrible idea. Um, <laughs> you, just, you can't, you can't do that. Um, and I, I wasn't smart enough at the time to really go and seek out that investment advice or to figure out what I should be doing with that money. Um, and so it was, it was largely squandered. Um, and I, I, I didn't have any problem with taking on responsibilities. So I was working at KCSU. I'd work other jobs. I was working. Um, for, you know, I would do freelance gigs here and there before the gig economy was really a thing. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was the responsibility of taking on that nine to five thing. It was not a problem for me. So when it came time to actually do something with that money, I just didn't have that other half of the skills. Um, I could be super responsible, pay my bills on time, make sure that all the money got there, what to do with, you know, or how to budget or whatever else. I think that was you know, something that I really lacked until I got to a point where, um, I got married and had kids and I was like, yeah, we'll do that to you. Yeah. It's like, I really need to have something in place beyond a will. <laughs> I need to have something in place to understand how my money works and why and where it's going, whatever else, even if just in theory, if I'm just looking at the checks and handing it off to somebody else, I in theory know what that check should be doing. Um, yeah. and what I should be looking for when I look at the numbers. So, uh, it's, I think that lack of getting that preparedness, um, and I don't know really, you know, I was never really pushed to do that per se. Um, I would go to my finance classes and my account. I had, I had two state awards in accounting, by the way. Nice. Um, and I, for, for the life of me, cannot tell you what my, my own business books are doing because it's just all fake money. Like it's, I, I have no clue. So I don't even focus on it. I let people who are smarter than me do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that that getting that training early on would have been a much, um, I would have been a much better place if I had set that money aside and done something smarter with it. Um, so that's the, the biggest blunder. Um, as to your other question, the, the thing that has stuck with me consistently, I know it's only supposed to answer one, but I, this is, it's really stuck with me for since day one, we had some people come into my high school and say, um, you know, I think they were debt collectors or something like that. It's oh, like, what the? This is what you should <laughs> That's be crazy. debt collectors. And then they had a financial planner with them at the same time. And they said, well, this is what you should be. You know, if you save this money, you'll be getting this return and this and that and the other thing. And uh, when I wised up to uh, how my money was supposed to be working more recently, I turned back into um, my financial planner. I said, well, this is what I was told. Like, this is the advice I was given. What do you think about this? Because I've been looking and I don't see anything like that. And that's, there's nothing lining up to what my expectations of this are and why. And he said, oh, you were, you were a high schooler in this time frame, weren't you? And when they came in and gave you that presentation, right? And it was like spot on. And I'm like, 
yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that doesn't work anymore. Here's what works. And so walk me through the entire thing. I was like, oh my gosh. Um, it was, what, it was, what was it? Just like an old, old way of doing investments or? No, it's like you're, you know, uh, it was before the dot com bust and like, everybody was investing in technology and everything else like that. And it was like the rate of return was something like, you know, nine to 12% or something like outrageous. No. Yeah. And well, was it was like, probably even higher than that back then. Yeah. Um, when you, when you factor in like the tech, like if you're only looking at the tech before the, the burst is ridiculous. Like, oh yeah. You'll get like a 50%, 20%, 100% percent annual returns. And, and one thing that, I'll probably end up covering in one of my uh, podcast episodes is there's so much misinformation out there, even from like financial professionals. So yeah. a lot of times financial professionals, what you don't know is if they're working for a company, they're being trained on how to sell stuff or how to talk about things and they're not doing their own thinking, which I know would not sit well with you. Like you would yeah. never be able to work at a company like that. And I had a difficult time myself. And so, um, yeah, it, it's interesting when, Basically, everything just kind of trickles on. This is how you have to say stuff. This is how you have to think about it. So that's that's interesting that, yeah, you really had some dated information. And again, it was probably just coming from whatever company um, bullet points for that month or that year or whatever happened to be. Yeah. So that's good. You got kind of recalibrated as far as your expectations. <laughs> totally realigned. And it was, it was eye-opening um, and completely changed my outlook on how money is managed and why and, and what I need to be doing with it and how I can save it and whatever else. Um, and I don't know if you've read Profit First. Um, I have not yet, but it is on one of my kind of two reads, especially being a business owner. Mike, he calls himself Mike Motorbike because Mike Michalowicz is too hard to spell. Um, but Mike has got some really... I love the ideas. It's like envelope budgeting, essentially, for your business. Okay. Um, and I love how solid the ideas are, but I cannot find a single accountant who is very able to, you know, able to do this and 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 do it well throughout, you know, bank accounts and whatever else, because every bank has its own like fees and whatever else. And he goes into like, oh well, you should negotiate with your bank, or you should go find a different bank, or you should go do. That. I'm like, no, I've been with this bank for like 20 years. I'm not skipping. They're really nice to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and they know you and whatever else. But like, if I open up six different accounts, like you're suggesting, or try and like, you know, manage it in imaginary folders in QuickBooks, how yeah. the hell you do that? I, <laughs> I'm not smart enough to do it. So I'm like, oh, well, let, let me find an accountant who can do it. Can't do it. So in theory, I love the idea. And I huh. think it's a really solid approach to helping business owners like me who are like, you know, we go to our tax accountant at the end of the year and they're like, congrats, you made like however much, you know, here's, here's your crazy amount of income that you made. Yep. I'm like, where? <laughs> it's not in my pockets. Do I have it on me? Do you have it? Is it somewhere? Yeah. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. It's there for you to, to use for reinvestment. And then, yeah. Do you kind of pay yourself uh, like monthly, like a flat amount then? Is that kind of how that works? I will be honest with you that the, my business accounting has been my biggest struggle in, in WTF. Okay. Um, I can go out, I can, you know, I can get clients like nobody's business. I can <laughs> write content like nobody's business. I can market, I can network, I can do all the stuff that you're supposed to do. Um, my office is relatively clean. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm, I'm wearing a, quite a few hats really well, but CFO is not one of them. And okay. the, the counting in my business has always been a struggle. Um, I've, I had to fire three accountants in this last year, um, who Ooh, just were not, year. yeah, this year who were not doing their job, um, and could not explain to me how my books worked or how to, um, we've, we've got a certain spending pattern that we need to change up and they couldn't explain how to, you know, change it up. And so there's a lot of little nitpicky things that, that I think as a business owner, I'm like, I have an expectation that it flows like this. Yeah. Um, and so now I've just started like, um, my goal now is just to gift all the accountants that I work with a copy of Profit First so they know what the heck I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> well, and like, and I, when I say envelope budgeting, then they get it. But I'm just like, you know, you really have to understand how cash flow works in the business because. Yep. Yeah, definitely different than personal finance. Like they're like, I'd say 80, 90% of it is like the same concept. Yeah. But 
that like 10% difference is, is pretty dramatic. It's killer. Um, as far as being able to open up like multiple accounts, I actually used to work at the first tech credit union that was on the HP campus. Mm -hmm. And so like credit unions are pretty great at not charging fees. And I would have clients that or uh, when I was working there, they were members and they would open up like 20 different accounts. Like this is for travel. This one's for this car replacement and, and things like that. So it, it is possible. It's not easy to implement. Like you have to have a mind shift. You have to change some of your behavior. And yeah. that's actually part of the process for my clients that actually do need that hardcore budgeting. We will go through the process to get them to at least segment a few different savings accounts. Maybe they'll get up to like four or five. Um, and then maybe two or three check-ins depending on if the individual spouses need them. So it is possible, but yeah, it's not an easy shift, especially for a business owner who's probably on fire with nonstop tasks to do. Um, yep. So I want to thank you, Nick, for joining me. This has been awesome. Um, definitely exceeded my expectations being my first uh, episode ever. And so um, really quickly, I know there's a million probably different ways people can get a hold of you, but if someone did want to reach out for your services or uh, just to kind of network with you, What's the, the best single place to do that? And then also make sure uh, after we get off the call that you send me any links to, to your books, all the different projects you're working yeah. on. I'll make sure they get into the show notes. Yeah, the easiest way to get a hold of me is wtfmarketing.com. Um, and you can also find me at that moniker on your preferred network of choice. Reach out anytime. There's an email me link straight on the website anyway, so you can reach out. Um, and Fort Collins Comic Con, which is August 17th and 18th, if you're watching this in 2019. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you're watching me in the future, the dates remain to be seen. But yep. <laughs> uh, it's fococomiccon.com. Um, and you can also just search Fort Collins Comic Con. Awesome. Yeah. And if you're anywhere in Northern Colorado, you should check out any of the things that Nick mentioned that were of interest to you because there's a lot of cool things and I didn't even know half of them until I met Nick. And now just like being friends with him on Facebook and, and on LinkedIn and all these different ways, he's saying that he's interested in events. I was like, man, that's cool. I went to this uh, cool gaming convention back in the fall uh, because you said you were interested in it. I actually took one of my clients and it was like his favorite event thing that he's ever done. And I, I have to say it was pretty awesome for me too. So I appreciate everything you do for the Northern Colorado community and for joining me today. And uh, I really appreciate all the, the great insights. Thank you, Lucas. I appreciated being here and it was a lot of fun. Awesome. Perfect.